is so stupid that it puts you ahead of the line. A nation that is so stupid that it gives you every benefit whatsoever, even though you haven't worked a day in the country. What would you do the minute you started to accrue any, any, any money? Well, maybe you'd send some home to your mother or your father to help them come here so they too can cash in on this stupid society. But what you'd also do is you try to get your foothold in this new country, and you'd want to get that little house with a white picket fence. You'd want to buy yourself a pickup truck, and you want to buy yourself some nice clothing. Now, who would you elect to run this country? Would you elect an idiot, a socialist idiot like Bernie Sanders, who's going to take your money away from you after you earned it? Would you vote for an old hag like Hillary Clinton, who you well know is nothing but an untrustworthy mouthpiece for special interests? Or would you vote for a very wealthy American man who embodies the very things you wish one day you could have or your children could have? That's why Trump is popular amongst even the Hispanic illegal alien uh, uh, group in this country. Now, you're not going to hear this on Puny Vision because Puny Vision is an arm of the Mexican government. And of course, they want to dump the people from their country that they can't take care of on us. I would do it, too, if I lived in Mexico and ran the country. If I had millions of people who couldn't make a living and I couldn't support, of course I would send them to a country that's stupid enough to do it for me. And that's why this is becoming such a hot issue. But it's not a new issue. It's an old issue, by the way. And then we have some spillover effects. And that is most of the social service money is being sucked up into the illegal alien community, as you well know. And a lot of it's not getting down to the people who need it on the bottom who have lived here all of their lives. Those would be the homeless so-called. And that's, uh, they're, they're interrelated problems, by the way. If you want to uh, talk about that, let's talk about that. Let's see. Uh, KBOI, Jim, welcome to the Savage Nation. Your solution, please. Thank you, Mike. Hey, hey listen, we don't need a fence, Michael. All you have to do is cut the cream off, cut the funding. We didn't have this problems in the 50s and 60s. It's, it's that simple. You cut that off. And the riffraff will stop. The ones that we want to come over, the hardworking folks, guest worker program, that's it. And, and uh, uh, the corruption in, in politics. Well, what you're saying is cut out the social services for non citizens? Well, exactly. I mean, and. Well, but you see, here's a problem. The biggest linchpin in that problem are the anchor babies. Because if someone has a baby here, then the mother automatically becomes a citizen, and she can bring in the father, if there is one that she knows of, and the uncle and the aunt and the grandfather. And so the first problem is the 14th Amendment, which was never written to permit non-citizens to become citizens. Never was it intended for that. Do you remember I read the actual author of the, uh, of the amendment back in the 1860s on this show last week? Did you happen to hear that? I listen to your show a lot. I don't know if I picked that up or not. No, everyone missed it. I was in New York. And I had the best research on this subject in the United States of America. I actually read the 14th Amendment as written by the senator who wrote the law and what he intended. And it's shocking. He said it was never intended for non-citizens, meaning uh, non-Americans, uh, to become citizens. Never. Never. He said that. It was not intended for non-Americans to be made citizens with this amendment. But it was stolen by the, uh, shall I say, I'll call them the ultra-tolerant brigades, who live off uh, uh, the illegal aliens and live off the uh, the other people who are benefiting from these uh, from these benefits benefits? I love the word benefit itself. See, I'm a former social worker, and I think that's important for you to know, so you don't think I'm a bad guy. Back in the '60s, one of my first jobs was that as a social worker because I was a very idealistic young man. Came out of college, I've been brainwashed into being a good boy. And as Winston Churchill said, if you don't have a heart at if you don't have a heart at twenty, how did he put it? If yeah, whatever. I can't even think of it right now. If, if you're not a liberal at twenty, you have no heart. And if you're uh, still a liberal at forty, you have no mind. It was something along those lines. I'm paraphrasing and making it into my own. So I was a good young liberal guy, and I went to work as a social worker, and I found that how well those on welfare were being treated compared to me. I was a young college graduate. I was making $5,500 a year, and I was sleeping on a mattress in a rental apartment in Flushing, New York, commuting to Manhattan and working on the Upper West Side of Manhattan as a social worker. And I had to go into these houses, and they were called clients, by the way, even then. The welfare recipients were already being called clients, don't you know? 
you know, not welfare recipients, but clients. All right, so I go in there and this and that, and I would see things going on like they weren't allowed to have telephones and they keep the phone underneath the bed. And once the phone started to ring and I said, Mrs. R, don't you think you want to answer your bed? It's ringing and stuff like that. I turned it into jokes that I turned into a play that's not yet been published and may be published in the near future. You know, things I saw as a young social worker. But what was not funny to me was here I was a native born American college graduate living worse than the welfare recipients. Why do I say that? I'll give you an example. My supervisor told me to get out the checkbook when I came back to the office, the New York City Welfare Department. And she said, okay, we'll mark it down. One bed, $140. One, two nightstands, $80 each. Uh, coffee table, $80. Sofa, $110. Two lamps, $150, and so on. And it was about $3,000. And I said, wait a minute. I have to take this check from the Welfare Department and give it to Mr. Uh, Mr. R to buy furniture? I said, I'm sleeping on a mattress on the floor. She said, well, the, we feel that any civilized family needs to have furniture in the apartment to feel good about themselves and go out and be a productive citizen. That was the beginning of my road from liberalism to where I am now. I don't say it happened instantly, but boy, did my eyes open to what a welfare state uh, was and how nutty it really was. That's a true story. Later on in life, after killing myself, uh, to get a PhD, and I'll say it again till you finally hear it. I was a high school teacher, and I wanted to be a college teacher. It was my greatest goal. So I earned two very high-end master's degrees, publishing both as uh, as papers in major journals. And then I got a PhD from the University of California at Berkeley because I was told by all my liberal professors that a PhD was a union card and that once I got the PhD, I automatically would have a tenured professorship so I could do my research and I could you know, have an enjoyable life. Well, unfortunately for me, the ACLU said that some of you white people will just have to put your, your lives on hold while others get ahead of you. I, those are the exact words that you'll have to put your life on hold so others can advance in society. Well, I was one of those who had to put his life on hold. I had two young children. I wanted to teach. I was rejected from 200 colleges with an almost straight A average and six published books at the time. And they were hiring, pe hiring people who were far less qualified than I was, which is why the universities have degenerated into the smoldering ruins that you see now. Uh, and so I then had to go out into the wilderness of the job market for 20 some odd years until I discovered that I had other talents. And here I am years later as a very successful broadcaster and, and writer. I always was a writer, but okay, I've achieved a certain degree of success. And the fact of the matter is, I'm not complaining about it, but the cauterization that occurred as a result of those years of wandering in the desert, because the socialism of our country had already penetrated every avenue of, uh, of our society, that that is what really turned me into who I am today. I became an utter realist, and I learned that in order to survive, you better open your eyes as to what's really going on. So here I stand before you, now talking about today, bums defecating in the streets of San Francisco, urinating openly, Kate Steinle being shot by an illegal alien, the crime, by the way, still not uh, being talked about anymore. It's as though she died for nothing. And so we have real problems, social problems in this country. And I believe that it's a philosophical problem behind it all. Not I believe, I know it is. I don't, I don't believe it at all. I know it. I know it for a fact that it's a philosophical issue rather than a strict social issue. And the philosophy is that of ultra tolerance versus realism. I'll be right back to talk about the latter, not the former. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust to protect my wealth with gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. All right, this just came in in the New York Post. You heard about this terrible situation of the... Uh, the uh, fired reporter who killed a, a, a woman reporter and a newsman shooting at point-blank range. Thank God this animal is dead. He said, what sent me over the top was the church shooting. On-air killer wanted a race war. The suspect, the suspect, the, the animal in the deadly on-air shooting of a reporter and cameraman in Virginia said the Charleston church massacre made him snap. 
telling ABC News in a rambling manifesto that he wanted to spark a race war between blacks and whites. Quote, my name is Bryce Williams. Why did I do it? I put down a deposit for a gun on 6 15 The church shooting in Charleston happened on 6 15 Wrote Vester Lee Flanagan II, a former on-air reporter who worked at Roanoke affiliate WDBJ under the name Bryce Williams. He said, what sent me over the top was a church shooting, and my hollow point bullets have the victim's initials on them. As for Dylan Roof, you blank, you want a race war blank? Bring it on, then, you white blank. Williams added that the that Jehovah spoke to him, telling him to target on-air reporter Allison Parker and cameraman Adam Ward during a lot. Well, I don't have to read anymore. All you know is that you have a deranged evil man who had tried to use the race card before when he was fired for being a troublemaker. And it was, he was such a liar that even the EEOC, which is stacked in his favor, threw the case out. So... Claimed to have been a constant victim of racism, sexual harassment, and bullying. And he said most of it was because he was a gay black man. All right, so you get the whole picture. Meanwhile, he snapped, so to speak. And he killed his poor woman and the, and the, and the uh, sound man. And then killed himself while well, the cops finally caught him in a ditch and this and that. What are you going to make of a story like that? What can you say about a thing like that? What in the world can you say other than what kind of country am I living in? Who are you going to blame for it? you got a lot to blame. Easy access to guns. Uh, let's say, uh, easy access to uh, excuses. Let's say Obama's war on the police. Let's say Al Sharpton's war on the police and white people. Let's say the loose tongues of Eric Holder for so many years, uh, blaming the police for policing. Things like that. You know, it all adds up. It's like a trickle effect. Eventually, it takes the uh, weak people and it gets into their psyche and they snap. So there are uh, results of this kind of a talk by government officials who trigger these things. That's all. It's 55 minutes after the hour, and there are many, many crazy stories out there. Let's go to the Drudge Report, who has been carrying the story since the, the early part of the day. Reporter murdered live on air, media shock. We've seen that. The uh, San Fran bum. Uh, literally, it's so disgusting that I talked about it for two and a half hours. And the reason it's happening... The reasons it's happening are manifold. It started with the release of the mentally ill from the hospitals under Edmund G. Pat Brown, who wrote the, the, the passed the law under him. Reagan inherited the law and had to enact the law, and the mental hospitals were closed and the bums were put into the street. The, the mentally ill ones were put in the streets under the, the theory that mental hospitals were very evil. It was a snake pit, and uh, they deserve better. You know the whole liberal story. So now we have this many, many years later, and the answer, of course, is to reopen the mental hospitals, stop giving them drugs and food, and make them work for a living. They want to check. They want to have welfare. If you're able-bodied, you work. I mean, there are solutions to the problem. And then if you put these armies of the homeless, the able-bodied ones, to work in the valleys and the orchards, picking the fruit, initially they will not be able to do it. They'll refuse to do it. But you know, hunger is an amazing motivator. Hunger is one of the most amazing motivators for work that God has ever created. Did you know that? If you give a man a fish, he won't fish. If you give a man a fishing rod, he's liable to go out and fish. 